It's funny that you mentioned that. He had a Marvel comic. I think it came out in 79. And so seeing that comic back as a kid, that is the first way I had ever heard of him was that. The comic really? Book. Yeah. And I, I kind of knew, oh, yeah, that's some rock and roll guy. Oh, that guy's scary. Oh, that's not for me. I, that's, that, that's too much. Right? And then I ended up playing with him years later. That's so crazy. Serendipitous. <laughs> You. I don't know. Do you want a rock, paper, scissor? Rock, paper, scissors? Okay, right, ready? ready? Rock, rock, paper, paper scissors. scissors, shoot. Uh, ah, okay. you win. I win. Okay, I am honored that I get to introduce this guest one more time. Not only is he extremely talented, but he is also extremely kind. And I think that is what's most important. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Glenn Sobel. Rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> you know, yeah, keep it fun. Why not? Yeah. How are you guys? How's it going, Glenn? Good to see you again. Yeah, it's good. I'm just in my kitchen again because, you know, I'm going to be comfortable and not try to be all cool with, you know, gear and drums behind me. I'm just kitchen, you know, casual. I love, I love the kitchen. I feel like it's my, it's my favorite place to be. It's the place in the house with all the, well, all the snacks, <laughs> you know? Exactly. It's awesome, man. I, I like your kitchen too. Looking nice. Los Angeles, it's just really rainy today, so everyone's just staying in. Ah, it's like one of the five days of the year that it's rainy, right? I'm not too familiar with LA weather. I hear it's a little fickle. Yeah, this has been the first time we've had any serious rain in a, in a minute, but it's a good change of pace. I like it. Awesome. Awesome. So Elgin, you want to start us out? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, so like uh, backstage before we started the show, we were talking about technology and whatnot. And it's so cool how much technology keeps people uh, connected. And we get to take a look into your life, checking out your social media, Instagram. Like not speaking of technology. Speaking of technology, saved by the Avon panel. calling. Yeah, right. Anyone good? Amway. I'm doing a, a live energy thing. I'll call you back. Okay. This is awesome. Perfect timing. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's still, and you still have the landline. Um, uh, wow. Oh my God. I just outed myself as a guy with a landline. Whoa. That's, that's, what, that's what awesome, you? man. Keep Keeping it authentic. Breaking news. All right. And I got one of those rotary phones. You know, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> Paging Mr. Sobel. Paging Mr. Sobel. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anywho. Um, you hated dialing anybody that had a bunch of zeros and nines in their number? You don't. Yeah. You don't. You don't. I'm, I'm, I'm showing my age, but okay. No, definitely. I had I had one of those in my old house. We're older we than we look. <laughs> we couldn't afford the good one. Um, but yeah, we want to talk about technology a little bit, keeping up with your social media. And recently you've been posting something super, super cool, super cutting edge. Uh, and it's the the Eddie Van Halen mural that uh -oh. is interactive. And I thought that was so cool to follow the progress of that. I was wondering if you can give us some insight on that and talk to us about it a little bit and your involvement in that. Oh yeah, well my involvement is just that I saw it. That is my really, that's my good buddy, Robert Vargas. He is one of the go-to guys in the world for doing those giant kind of wall murals on the sides of buildings. So what better person than him to do an Eddie Van Halen tribute on the side of Guitar Center on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And so he started working on this. And then another couple of guys that I had met a long time ago, they specialize in this whole thing of augmented reality. So they approached him and Guitar Center within days of the unveiling to do this whole thing where if you, uh, you know, you take your phone and you have the QR code app and you scan this QR code that's right there on the side of the building. It's about this big. You, most people have seen what a QR code is. You scan it into the app and then you look at the mural through your phone. You see it moving like that. Right. Augmented reality. It's amazing. And what I did was I screen recorded some of it and shared it on my social media. Yeah, so awesome. it was so cool to see. And if anybody is interested in what we're talking about, uh, check out his Instagram at Glenn underscore Sobel. But um, yeah. yeah, it was it's so cool to see. Robert's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what a great tribute to the wonderful Eddie Van Halen. I mean... Now, what was the connection between that and Guitar Center? What was that all about? Well, I just think that since Robert is a go-to guy for that, he already knows everybody there. He's very well known for doing murals of all kinds of musicians and paintings. He painted me. Maybe I'll put up a post of that one of these days. He did yes. an interesting portrait of, of me. Just um, He did it quickly after a sound check I had in L.A. a couple of years ago, but... I just think it was a, a matter of someone called someone and it just made too much sense to do it. And that was the perfect place. 
That's yeah. amazing. Well, it looks awesome. And I, you know, uh, thanks for sharing it. Cause you know, we wouldn't have seen it oh, otherwise. Yeah. I'm sure. Very, yeah. very cool. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's like, we, that's part of the soundtrack of our lives, Van Halen. So I what, what, that. What, what do you think it was about Eddie that made him so iconic and kind of set him apart from other musicians? Oh man, that is a good question. Look, he, he came out. I try to always picture what it was, it would have been like in 1978. If you were just a kid that was into rock and then all of a sudden eruption came on the radio, which was the guitar solo on the first speaker, or, you know, you really got me. I think that was really the first radio single, but mm. just to hear that. And I just, I just know what it was like. People were like, they'd stop and they'd go, wait a minute, what's this? And I heard all these stories about how Van Halen was the opening act for certain very big bands and the guitar players in those big bands, they would hear Eddie for the first time and they would be sure to show up early every night and watch the whole thing before their own show to watch this new phenom, Eddie Van Halen. It, it was his swagger and his solos, obviously his technique. The guy reinvented the instrument more than once. Wow. You know, every, every you yeah. have this whole new technique that no one had heard. No one had ever done it before with guitar. Obviously, the first record had eruption, but then there were other records like the intro to Mean Streets was this cool percussive thing. Then he had Cathedral on Diver Down where he's using the volume knob on and off with his pinky finger. And it's like, wow, this guy just keeps blowing our minds. You know, he's like Miles Davis, the jazz musician that kept reinventing the genre. Wow. Well, That's it, really is, awesome. it is. And I'm so glad that now there's this beautiful mural and, that I, what a wonderful tribute to a wonderful musician. Yeah. That's awesome. So, okay, kind of to segue away from that just a little bit, Glenn, the last time that we had you on the stream, as we were kind of wrapping up, we had asked you a question about, um, I guess maybe being part of like the comic book world when you were a kid. And I remember you yeah. mentioning that you did have a comic business with your dad. So is there something yeah. that you could tell us more about that? I, I think that that's really awesome. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, we had this comic book business. I was way into it. So seeing like the X-Men movies, you know, like Days of Future Past, the Sentinels, I'm like, oh, I remember that. That was X-Men number 142 with the Sentinel on the cover. Wow, they made that into a movie. That's that's great. You know, I was into the stories. It was actually pretty great writing back then. People don't always appreciate the great writing and how inventive they would get. But it started like that as a collector and a fan. Then it turned into being a business and my dad was a stamp dealer. So he was always taking in stamp conventions. And so the natural progression was to take in, take a booth at the local Los Angeles comic book show, which was, I believe at the ambassador hotel back in the day, it was monthly. And then there was the San Diego comic con that was yearly, but that was before it blew up into this giant multimedia event that it became. It was still a big. monster, yeah. still big, but it wasn't like what it got to be known as. But yeah, that's how it started. Did that for a few years and learned a lot about, you know, buying wholesale and being able to price things competitively and using the overstreet price guide, all that stuff. Sure. Awesome. That's really cool. Do you still have any of the old comics and stuff that you uh, yeah. may have had? Or no? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I just, I worry that, you know, some of them could have gotten kind of damaged over the years. Not all of them had the backer boards or the Mylar uh, bags, they're like the hard bags, if you remember those. Yeah. That's what we used back then to stop them from being creased. I, I remember having multiple copies of certain key issues. I just, I got to look. I'm afraid to see, you know, they're not in mint condition. They're in maybe fine or very fine condition, which lowers the value a lot. Right. Well, if you had to, if you had to think off the top of your head, what would you say? Uh, I mean, not to, you know, uh, blow up your spot, but what, what's your most like expensive comic that you own, you think? Hard to say because I'm so out of it. I mean, X Men 137, the Dark Phoenix issue, is that still a big deal? If you own it, yes. <laughs> Multiple copies of it, sure. That's just, amazing. I don't know what condition that that's in, but all around the that was number 137. So multiple copies of issues around that time. Wow. Very very cool. Yeah. And what do you have a specific writer or superhero that uh, you were drawn to as a child? I liked X-Men. I, I liked it a lot. I liked the, the teamwork and the sort of clever ways that they would uh, use their, their powers. That was always a good one. And uh, God, what else did I like? I mean, I liked a lot of the basic stuff like Superman and Batman. And I know that 
I have a lot of the Dark Knight uh, miniseries comic book that ran way back, which I think, help me out here, was that Frank Miller? Did he draw that? Probably. It sounds very Frank yeah, Miller. I I'm not sure. I, I cannot confirm that, but sounds like it. Yeah, and Daredevil 158, I might might have at least a couple copies of that still. That was the first Frank Miller art back then. And uh, Legion of Superheroes, number 287. That was the first Keith Geffen, I think was his name. That yeah. was a big deal in the 80s. And, and I found like a ton of copies. There was this place that they would take all the comics that would be at 7-Eleven, because that's where you'd buy new issues, mm -hmm. you know, the spinning rack thing, and you'd go and you'd buy. But what happens to all the issues that don't get bought? They got to go somewhere. They get sent back to these different warehouses. So somehow I ended up in this one warehouse where they have like just thousands and thousands of these comics that get put back mm -hmm. you know, in sell because I got to make room for the, the next issue. So I found like, I don't know, 150 copies of that one Legion of Superheroes issue for 36 cents an issue because it was, it was uh, wow. you know, a percentage off of the cover price. And it probably sold at the time for, I don't know, seven or eight bucks. So a pretty good markup, right? I mean, yeah. not, not a giant $100, $500 issue, but it was things like that that I remember most is, is those discoveries, you know, as a, as a dealer. Awesome. And obviously now we're yeah, living in a nerd now. People are like, I didn't know you. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, didn't and know that, them, though. That, I like that. We're getting to know you on a I just went level. right back into all of that. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, wow, I remember that. And that, that X-Men 137 uh, is actually at a grade 9.8. It's worth, uh, it says here, $375. Oh, nice. What is 9.8 now? Is that like a rating of how the condition? Probably I'm guessing a 9.8 out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, depending on well, at least that's what it says here on this website. And who knows if the internet's okay. lying oh, to me or not? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Google. Uh, so, Glenn, obviously now a lot of these comic books are being translated into films. So, do you have any of the films that you are, you know, a fan of? Maybe the X Men films or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely more of a Marvel guy. Although Dark Knight, the second Batman that was Christopher Nolan, that is one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. But I'm more of a Marvel guy, always have been. And the X-Men series, those are obviously great, especially First Class and Days of Future Past. It's just great to see that just because I remember so many of the the characters, like the, the Sentinels. For and sure. It just, I love the time travel aspect of it. That was super inventive. And Marvel's been doing really well. Avengers, of course, I read that back in the day. And, you know, the Vision and Scarlet Witch, they really... They put a lot into it, like a lot of good fan service in these movies. Are you yeah, watching WandaVision? Have, yeah. WandaVision, yeah. I haven't watched, that's on Disney Plus, which I don't have. That's weird. What's what's that all about? They're like living together like Lucy and Ricky. So this, uh, Algin, are you caught up? I don't want to give spoilers. No, you know, I mean, feel free to no, spoil No, no, I, I don't want to spoil it. I don't think that that's fair. But basically, they're living in this augmented reality where every episode is a different decade. And we're trying to figure out why it's happening, who's doing it, uh, who's involved in it. And mm. this current episode kind of gives the most information, but I don't want to give anything away. Does, it's it take place, does it take place before? post post snap? So post infinity wars, but not, not post end game, obviously post end game. Yeah. Post end game, I believe is where it well, vision was dead. He got the, the mind stone taken. Correct. Uh, so this is all happening in Wanda's mind. I can't. Here. I just watch the show. I don't want to. Uh, I'm just. I'm just speculating. Okay. okay. I gotta get Disney Plus. Yes, it, it's worth it. It's it's been a real fun watch. Cool. Woo. All right. We'll do. Wow. So talking about comic books, comic book characters, and you know, uh, speaking of comic books, Alice Cooper has his own uh, comic book, and he, in my opinion, he's like a walking comic book character. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what were what were your first impressions when you became aware of Alice Cooper and the glamour of being like a shock rock band? It's funny that you mentioned that he had a Marvel comic. I think it came out in '79, and so seeing that comic back as a kid. That is the first way I had ever heard of him, was that, the comic Really? Book. Yeah. And I, I kind of knew, oh, yeah, that's some rock and roll guy. Oh, that guy's scary. Oh, that's not for me. I, it's, that is too much. Right? And then I ended up playing with him years later. That's so but, crazy. Serendipitous. <laughs> yeah. That's that's how I was first made aware of him. I hadn't heard Schools Out yet or anything. And then years later, uh, bands were covering Alice. Like, Crocus did a version of Schools Out. It was all over MTV. 
And that might have, I hate to say it, that might have been the first way I heard School's Out. Wow. And it's like, oh, that's a cover of that guy Alice Cooper on the comic book. Oh, okay. Yeah. The comic book guy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then, of course, you know, you realize, oh, this, this guy built part of what is rock and roll, not just the theatrics, but the glam aspect and songwriting and that whole original band was just such an influence. And if you only know just the hits and a little bit of the superficial knowledge, you don't realize how influential the original Alice Cooper band was. Yeah. Yeah. I, you could definitely see, you know, uh, sprinkles of his influence, even in music today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He's definitely an influential artist and, and a pioneer. But yeah, I, I always love like hearing the Shep stories, like, you know, about when they played in a club and they were wearing like uh, see-through outfits, but it was like kind of steamy in the club. So like you, you couldn't tell that they were naked. And then I guess it was Shep that called the cops to get them to come try to arrest the band. And that I, one I never heard. That's a good one. I haven't heard that one. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, yeah Shep was definitely, he was hustling in different ways that kind of flirted with breaking the law you know, like like causing a traffic jam in Piccadilly Square in London with a giant billboard on a truck advertising the show at Wembley Arena in 73. That was all done on purpose. Like, wow, you caused a traffic jam? That's pretty That's pretty ballsy. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I but the it. out. And I was going to say, like, in this, you know, obviously a lot more things are virtual these days. I actually got to do a master class with Shep a couple months ago. It was really awesome, very informative. So I'm glad was I had the opportunity. Was that through Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp? That it was, yeah. Yeah, okay. That must that have been some great stories. He he loves to tell stories. Yeah, it was it was awesome. I'm really glad that I did it. But um, that Between Shep and Alice and Bob Ezrin, who's been the producer on a lot of this, they love to tell stories, and there's tons of stories. You know, they were around for all this stuff. And and then the Alice original band members, they've come out on tour with us. We did this run of shows in the UK in 2017. So we had uh, Dennis Dunaway, the bassist, Michael Brooks, the guitar player, and Neil Smith, the drummer. And they rode on the bus with us for a week and a half or so. And at the end of the set, this was actually a blast. They would come out and they would do a mini set at the end of our set, like four songs of the original band. And then all nine of us would play schools out with two drum sets and two bass wow. players and 17 guitar wow. players, it seemed like. But yeah, that was so much fun. And those guys told a bunch of stories. They're, they're all just cool. What I wouldn't give to see that live. Yeah, I know people felt like ripped off that they didn't get that in their city. It was only in the UK. Yeah. Dang it. All right, well. It happens, that's how it happens sometimes. Yeah. Those are the breaks. <laughs> the breaks. Well, uh, Michael actually had a question. He wanted to know what you think is the most challenging Alice song to play live. Uh, I don't know. Some of them all seem to have their own sets of challenges just to keep keep it consistent every night. But lately, um, maybe Roses on White Lace, because that's that's a good that's the most metal tune in the set. The hmm. last time we were on tour, and it's been a minute. But yeah, that's a good metal tune. A lot of double bass fills. It's busy. And it's just keeping it uh, on the same intensity level every night. That's a nice challenge. But then there's others that are a challenge because maybe they're uh, a slower tune that needs to be kept, you know, with the intensity level dialed back consistently the same every night. Like My Stars is a good one. It's slow, but it's also got a busy aspect to it. And these are deep cuts I'm talking about. They're not big hits, but boy, if people are like, genuine big Alice fans. They are so appreciative when we play songs like that live. Yeah, I love that so much. Uh, so obviously you were just talking about, you know, being in the UK and you've traveled all over the world. So whether it's, you know, whatever project that you've been involved in, what would you say would be the strangest or the most unique venue that you've ever played in? Oh God, I don't know. There's been some funny ones. Uh, I mean, I can't think of a specific venue. There's just been some weird bars with a weird scene of people. Not necessarily with Alice, but I just mean back in the day, paying all the dues, playing some places, you know, like where we had to borrow gear because our gear didn't make it. This is when I was playing with Gary Hoey, the instrumental guitar player. He had a, a hit on radio in the 90s, and that was like my first U.S. tour and I just remember like our gear didn't make it and we were playing this place, the intersection in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the old intersection. People know that venue if you know Grand Rapids. And so we had to borrow gear. And so our tour manager had to go to this guy's 
place and borrows drum set, but the guy wasn't home, but they let him in anyways to get the drums to the venue. And we realized, or someone realized, miking up the bass drum, that the bass drum happened to be the place where the guy was stashing his piece, his gun. <laughs> wow. Oh, God. I was going to play the gig with a loaded gun and the bass drum and, and the, the drum set was just a piece of crap. It was just, it was a funny thing. That's, that's the first thing I think of. Wow. Every beat is potentially shooting yourself. <laughs> oh, no. Talk about Russian roulette. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Holy hell. Okay. That answers the question. For but, sure. that's not, that doesn't really say a funny, weird venue. That's, that's a tough one. There have been some strange venues. I'll have to think about that and get back to you. No oh worries. I, I think that that answer was perfect. So. That brought back so many <laughs> memories for me. Of what? Being in a boy band in Germany oh. and performing at a theme park in between the juggling act and then like the the character show. Oh, God. What was so the boy band you were in? It was a, a boy band called Image, and uh, it wasn't a – big band we were just over there in germany trying to make it over there back in early 2000 and uh and that was one of our gigs we did like a week-long gig at a at a theme park the cool thing is we got to ride rides all day it was, it was, oh, nice. it was amazing I, that's actually how i found out about elgin back when i was what 14 or 15 years old i'm like it's the kid from image that's so, and now, yeah. now we're friends what a life wow. well, you guys were you you were on the radio you were on mtv yeah yeah, I was on uh, MTV Kid Cadet. We used to do like Radio Disney back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> what a life. You yeah. come from that whole thing of like the, the Disney Channel or Mickey Mouse Club or any of that? Do you uh, kick it? You, no, I don't know. I Me, no. I was asking like, was that your scene? Like when you were a kid, you were doing the Disney stuff and- yeah, so when I was like 11 and 12, I was called a kid caster. So they would bring me in to interview like celebrities uh, at the local Radio Disney show. So like I interviewed O-Town, Vitamin C, uh, a couple other bands. And it was really cool. But then I aged out when I was 13. They're like, sorry, kid, hit the road. She got the menudo treatment. They were like, you got to go. <laughs> but it was it was a really fun time. And you know that. 13. Wow. What a Hollywood story. <laughs> right? I know, but you know, it was, it was pretty neat because it gave me, you know, the, the guts to get to talk to people. And that's what I love doing most. Is well, you were getting amazing experience at a young age. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> so you were talking, you were talking about being on tour and you know, uh, all the stuff that you have to bring with you, your equipment and whatnot, but like, what's something that you always have to bring with you on tour. That's not like equipment related. Oh, um, like if you like some of your like your things you need on your rider or just like personal <laughs> items that you just need uh, a good pillow for the bus. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the ones that they provide, they're just like this flat thing. And then your neck, you're, you're like sleeping like this and you wake up and your neck's all stiff. And I can imagine what's that like tour bus life. It is not for everybody, I guess you could say, but if it starts to get to be a drag, I just got to remind myself, you know what, this is, what I wanted and I love what I do and no job is perfect. And it's actually awesome doing this and playing all over the world for crowds that want to come see us. So it's really not, it's not that bad. I mean, I say it's not for everybody just because not everyone is able to be away from home. Right. For that long. You know, the homesick, the homesickness can kick in just touring in general. And I've done every kind of touring there is from traveling in a van to flying private jets with Hollywood vampires and it's all exhausting. There is no perfect way of doing it, but you just, you got to take care of yourself. You got to get sleep and nutrition. It's not a 24 hour party, but yeah, a pillow comes to mind as one of the things I definitely need. One of the creature comforts of the road. Awesome. Well, okay. Since you did mention uh, Hollywood vampires, obviously, you know, they covered songs from legends that have since, passed on but is there an artist or a song that you guys are hoping to add to the repertoire there's always talk about certain songs we should do and maybe uh, if we resume touring soon maybe there'll be some stuff added to the set i bet there will be just because we don't like to keep doing the same set over and over again the the whole david bowie thing heroes with johnny singing that was kind of a last minute thing the way that happened. And we ended up putting it on the record. We recorded it when we were on a day off on tour in Berlin. Oh, cool. Yeah. In 2018. So you never know. Things could get added. I mean, it's a conversation that can go on forever of how about this? How about this? Half the fun is trying to figure out what you want to play. 
Fair. Uh, al- oop. Hold on, let me go to this question first. Uh, Eliza wants to know, uh, who is one of your most memorable guest stars with Alice and why? <laughs> What's up, Eliza? That's my friend Eliza. Oh. Uh, one of my most memorable guest stars. There's been a lot. We've had some good ones. I mean, look, we do this thing in Maui every year for New Year's. Obviously, we didn't do this most recent New Year's. But we we do Chef Gordon's benefit for the Maui Food Bank. And it's in this big hotel ballroom. And we get some of the coolest, craziest guests getting up with us. And so one year, School's Out, Jim Carrey got up and did School's Out with us. Wow. And he had the beard. Back then, I think it was three years ago. He had the beard, and then he had the Alice makeup on. It it, it was creepy. I saw that video, and yeah, okay. it's on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube, right? He's great though. Like he did yeah. good. I mean, like that was impressive. He's, he's so into it. How could he not be? You know, and he was way cool. And I, I I told him like, you know, this is like a weird dream. It's like, you know, having this dream that Jim Carrey is in Alice makeup but with a beard and on stage with us all of a sudden. This is very strange, but. Yeah, he, he loves music and loves to perform. And hopefully he'll do more with music in the future. But that was cool. And boy, just that one event, there's always so many great guests that join us. Every year, the last three years or so, Linda Carter plays with us. Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah. And she started as a singer. And so we do stuff like the Black Keys, Lonely Boy, except she calls it Lonely Girl. Mm. And uh, we do that Say La Vie tune, Chuck Berry. That's the Pulp Fiction dance of scene. Of course. And Uma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She picked some cool songs to do. And then every year, it's it's people that live in Maui that join us. Steven Tyler, Weird Al, the Doobie Brothers guys, uh, Pat Simmons and Michael McDonald. Uh, am I dropping enough names for you? No. No, it's actually More. awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. So okay. no, drop names. Yeah, my buddy, you know, Pat. But um, – <laughs> Yeah, Jim Carrey stands out as one of the most interesting guests for sure. Yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, you know, you're dropping a lot of names and it's awesome. It seems like you're very popular. You know a lot of people. But do you still get excited or starstruck when you meet certain stars like Jim Carrey or or like you said, Linda Carter? Yeah, it's um, there's always that thing. You're kind of split in two. It's like they're people just like you and me. And you might have grown up watching them, listening to them. So there's always that. Wow, this is crazy part but on the other half you know if it's a musician it's like okay we're all musicians we got a job to do and we're gonna have fun doing this so there's a camaraderie part of it but then there's also the wow mind blown that i'm playing with so and so but the more and more that happens the more comfortable you get with it and you just learn as far as my role in the whole show my role is to really drive the bus as usual the drums set the tempo and tone of the song more than anything else and i got to make everybody feel comfortable just give them what they they want to hear and if they're happy with it i'm happy with it and we have a good time and you kind of get past that like wow i'm i'm playing with this legend this is nuts you know you just you just want to do your job as best Ab- you can absolutely yeah i could definitely relate to that for you sure know, one of my most proudest moments though is like when we get joined by these these legendary people last minute, especially those are the good things. Cause there's a magic that can come out of it sometimes where you do barely any rehearsal and you just get up and go. Um, I saw the video. I passed by it. I don't know if it was a Facebook memory or something the other day. It was the Hollywood vampires tour and Ian Hunter joined us in Manchester, UK. He's the guy that was the singer in Mott the Hoople. So all the young dudes, is mm-hmm. the the big song back mm-hmm. and we did that tune it's a song I grew up in. and uh we just rehearsed it in the dressing room kind of acoustically beforehand and then we went out we played it to the arena and it, it sounded really good and that was a really proud moment playing with ian hunter very cool that's really awesome. And you had mentioned that, that was in your memories. And I actually wanted to talk about memories a little bit. And if you uh, had any good, like nostalgic music that put you in a good mood or what is some of your favorite mood music or things that trigger your favorite, like memories? Oh, it depends what day it is. Uh, I don't know. I heard, I heard uh, heart of glass by Blondie the other day and I'm like, yeah, now I'm in a good mood. It's just that groove and that riff lately things that really just, have a good solid groove like that good a good combination of groove and melody and i think that kind of tune is a great example 
of that. Yeah, for sure. Like I just have, I have a playlist of just like my mood music. I'll, I'll just put on uh, Sledgehammer, and it'll just, it'll just put I me in like the best mood. Oh yeah, my yeah. god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and or I'll put on uh, "Love the Day," "Love the Day," and I know I'm gonna have like a great day. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, music really does determine your mood. You know, like yeah. it's definitely you know better than any drug that I've for ever sure, had. for sure. Oh, I just. Yeah, cult music. of personality. Oh my god, that just like sure. makes me have the best day. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, music is a, a really healing thing. It can really, it's amazing how it can change your mood like that. For sure. For sure. Okay. So uh, another question for Michael. Um, so obviously you said he loved the addition of Constrictor and Raise Your Fist in the last tour, and but he said he heard that Freedom and Wind Up Toy were rehearsed. No, no, they were not. I don't know where you heard that, but you heard obviously, wrong, Michael. <laughs> No, obviously that's a very, a very devoted fan. And yeah, we had songs from Constrictor and Raise Your Fist and Yell. And we did not rehearse those others. Though. There have definitely been other songs that were rehearsed that did not make it into the set. But no, not those two. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. There you go. Uh, okay, so I think, oh, okay. Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, her name is Ludovica. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I, I believe... Yeah, she runs the Glenn Sobel Italia fan page on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Amazing. Very cool. Oh, that's awesome. So are you working on anything at the moment and something about a movie? Dot 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 question mark. Yeah, it's I guess not something that can be talked too much about yet, just because it's so far off. But I've been working with an actor who's playing a drummer in a movie. So I've been training this actor who fortunately yeah. had a very good sense of timing and coordination. So they are doing amazing. And they're one of the principal actors in this movie and it's a Netflix production. And uh, I guarantee you soon I'll be able to talk about it more. Like it, it might not be out though for, I don't know, maybe not till fall, winter. I, I don't know. It's hard to tell. Cause I know that production on the movie has been kind of slowed down because of COVID, you know, and Oh my God, they are so ultra, just vigilant about testing. I think I've tested almost 20 times where, you know, me and this actor, we were in a rehearsal studio and two drum sets set up, but the, the the COVID testing truck would come to us and we'd test. I've had so many swabs jumped up my nose. I'm better at it than the nurses. <laughs> I couldn't do it myself. Oh my God. Well, they're it's like, wow, you get that further up there than we do. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm an old pro by now. But because of all that, the, the movie shooting schedule uh, has been slowed down a bit. I was in, I had to fly out of state and be there a little bit back in October. But I think now they're they're shooting again, and I'm like I'm not needed. They're doing just fine without me. I, I'm proud of of him, and I, I wish I could talk more about it, but I will. Soon. Understandable. Yeah. What, when you can, you will. Okay, that's exciting. Something to look forward to. Yeah, right? it'll, be, it'll be a cool movie that musicians are gonna love. I think it's a good, oh, edgy, yeah. funny movie. Awesome. Well, uh, a final question before we get into the game, uh, since you mentioned COVID, and I'm sure this is a question that gets, you know, asked to you a whole bunch. And obviously, you don't know when tours are going to happen again. Everything's kind of up in the air. But mm -hmm. what do you think that concerts and live events are going to look like post COVID era? Who knows? Uh, uh it's just not feasible to do it any other way. People were talking about oh, pods and separate little enclosures for people, drive-in concerts. It just, it's not cost effective. Uh, the only way for it to return to what it once was is just to be able to have an arena full of people or a theater, a club, whatever. How else can you do it? What, what are some of the answers you've heard to that? Well, I mean, I have seen people in bubbles um, I've seen, you know, bubble concerts. Uh, my husband and I are actually going to a drive-in event um, in a couple weeks. So I'm really curious to see what, what that is. What are so you? it's not a band, Glenn. It is actually RuPaul's Drag Race is on tour. So we're going to go see our favorite drag queens. <laughs> so, I mean, no mind you, they will be performing, but mostly lip syncing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but... So th that's really all that I've heard. What about you, Elgin? Anything? Mostly a lot of people doing virtual things. I've seen the like risers that fit like four to six people that are like six feet apart. But like you said, it's not cost effective and it's not, 
the volume of fans in the stadium that you need, like you said, to, to turn a, a reasonable profit to make it even reasonable to do, or it doesn't make sense. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what's going to happen, but at the same time, you also have to get past the people's fear of even wanting to go to live events anymore. So that too, that's a great point. There's that too, the, the public's willingness to go out. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, with, with wrestling, wrestling is holding these live events. Now, mind you, a lot of them are outside, but they seat people, you know, in groups. Like if you're a family, you can sit together and then there's another family. But, outside you know. Now in January? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so AEW, <laughs> which films down uh, in Florida, it's not so bad right now. But then we yeah. also have WrestleMania coming up. You know, I don't know whether there's going to be a crowd. We have the Super Bowl coming up. I mean, so events are happening. Mm -hmm. Florida is notoriously more open than most places you know right. so right. i guess okay. we'll, we'll we'll be the guinea pigs and and see what happens with live events so time yeah, there, there are alice cooper and hollywood vampires dates on the books but whether they happen or not i mean look that's obviously another story that's i can't not say that but you know the fingers are always crossed that we'll get back to it sooner than later well, Absolutely. But, but the, the fact that it's on the books, though, is such a great, wonderful thing to possibly look forward to. I so know, we it's know also, that it's there. It's also so much potential disappointment, you know? Fair. Fair yeah, enough. True story. Boo. Well, we have a game, Glenn. This is our game of Would You Rather. And we're going to ask you some questions. Oh, yeah. There's no wrong answers. Uh, Elgin, do you want to yes. uh, read the first one? We'll get this thing kicked off. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Here we go, Glenn. Okay, would you rather collaborate with Dave Grohl or collaborate with Chad Smith? I'd say probably Chad Smith just because I, I know him a bit and he's such a funny guy and, you know, he did the whole thing with Will Ferrell. So we could do our own kind of funny drum off, I think, and we'd work out something pretty good. Although, you know, Dave Grohl, great too. But, yeah, Chad gets my vote just because uh, he's also a DW drummer. Oh. I think Dave Grohl is too, actually. They're both DW drum set players. Hey now, okay. Yeah. I, I've been following uh, the. Uh, I'm trying to think of what to call it. Like Dave has been in a competition with a young drummer. Yeah. I forget her oh, name. Oh yeah, it. the little girl's killing it. Yeah. yeah, she plays every instrument. Like you put an instrument oh, in her hand. Play more than just drums. That's wow. Yeah, she plays. Um, I want to say guitar, bass, guitar, and she also sings. So, mm. you know, this is amazing. Yeah, and this is all possible because of mobile devices videos get shared around and this came to the attention of Dave Grohl. Isn't that crazy? Life, man. That's what it's wonderful. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather. <laughs> okay. Join the Avengers or join the justice league. Oh, come on. Avengers. I mean, easily you get to <laughs> hang with, you know, RDJ, Robert Downey Jr. You know, yeah. this would have to be going back in time before end game, but I haven't even seen justice league. I don't know. People are like, ah, don't bother. It's, you know, DC is trying to be as cool as Marvel with the, I don't know, is it, uh, Justice League worth seeing? So well, then they're making this like four hour long extended. Snyder cut. cut. Yeah, yeah I heard about that. Cut. Um, was the original one worth seeing? No. Uh, hey, I'll be honest. It was terrible. Sorry. Oh, damn. Yeah. I like the Wonder Woman movies. I think those yeah, are decent. Yeah. Decent. And hey, hey, Linda with the cameo at the end of. Oh, that was cool. Linda with the cameo. Very, yep, very yeah. Cool. Pretty cool. But I think we all want to be Avengers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In another life. All right. Next one. Okay. Here we go. Oh, would you rather play play on an Alice Cooper jazz album or play on an Alice Cooper rap album? <laughs> How about an Alice Cooper avant-garde jazz rap album? Yep. Yeah. Sounds good to yep. me. That's the one. He make it work. He could sell anything, that guy. That's his thing. He sells, you know, his, his wife is an amazing singer and his son, you know, Dash is an amazing singer and Calico, his daughter can sing. And he's like, everyone in my family is a better singer than me, but I could sell a song better than anybody else. So he could do anything and make it work. Oh, I want this album. We, we follow his lead. I love that. Awesome. Okay. okay. 2022 Al Al Alice Cooper avant-garde. Let's look forward yeah. to it. Uh, here's the next one. Would you rather... Oh gosh. Okay, this one's a little rough. Okay, get punched by Mike Tyson or get kicked by Conor McGregor. Well, I don't know. I just think the Tyson would be more preferable, just because it would make a better story. Because you know, it'd be just like that scene out of The Hangover with Zach Galifianakis. Yeah, yeah. 
You know, they're all playing the air drum fill the, in the air tonight. I mean, come on. There's yeah. a drum angle to this. Yeah, the, the story it. would be better for sure. I see it. I see it. All right. All right, let's go to the next one. Would you rather perform with the most recent band you saw live or perform with the first band you ever saw live? Who is the most recent band I saw live? It's been so long. We're supposed to remember this stuff? No, no. <laughs> the most recent band I saw live that wasn't us, uh, does it count that it was a band that was a support act of us? Of course. Because that's easy. That's the MC50 with Wayne Kramer, uh, which is a 50th anniversary of MC5. Oh, those guys are cool. Kim Thale was on guitar. And uh, Billy, the bassist from Faith No More. Oh, that'd be great to play with them. All right. Uh, so then, on the, so who was the first band you ever saw live? Um, well, cool to me, but not the coolest answer as other people might have. But it was Dire Straits. On the oh, Brothers. cool. That's oh, awesome. That cool? Okay. Yeah, and, hell yeah. Money for nothing. Oh, yeah, my MTV. Tour, it, was, it was that tour, the Brothers in Arms tour. I saw it at the Greek Theater in L.A. That's what, what awesome. was yours, Elgin? Do you remember the first band you saw? First band I ever saw live. Wow. Um, I think I went to like Bob Marley Fest and I saw like the Marleys and like Lauren Hill and a bunch of cool artists like that. But no, as a kid, actually, I saw Tito Puente Jr. My mom took oh. me to a concert. That's so cool. I saw and, you know, he, that right. What a percussionist. He, he <laughs> was. Right. too, so. Not to brag, mine was Hanson. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Right, hey, they were huge. I yeah yeah. Okay, I still I still stand Hanson. I can't lie. <laughs> All right, here's the next one. Would you rather have a photographic memory or have telekinetic powers? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, telekinetic powers. That's like it's kind of fictitious. I don't have a photographic memory, but I have what some people would call an autobiographical memory. Mm. Which is oh, wow. remembering, you know, the dates of things in my life that happened. I don't. It's not perfect. It's not even close. You guys, you familiar with that actress Mary Lou Henner from Taxi? Yes. 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 Yeah. You could watch a clip of her on YouTube. It was from 60 Minutes Australia. I saw it. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. She, Absolutely. She's the real deal. Like she can, can recall every single yeah. date, time, the color of the shirt that the person was wearing. Yeah. That was walking across the street. Like it's crazy. I, I don't have it anywhere near what she has, but my friends, they will all tell you that my memory of things like that is pretty damn amazing. Like I can almost get it down to the date for certain things, even if it happened in the nineties, whatever. But yeah, it's an autobiographical memory. And Mary Lou Hatter, she said something on that, that interview. She said something that I've said, literally, she said, I could just see the timeline. You could see it. I'm like, Oh my God, I've said that. That's crazy. We, we knew That's, you were a superhero, Glenn. We knew. It's not a superpower, but it is. it's a memory. I don't know. Maybe it helps with remembering songs too. Who knows? Fair. All right. Next one. Okay. Here we go. Would you rather, would you rather play on the soundtrack for every Will Smith movie or play on the soundtrack for every Tom Cruise movie? Tough one, right? But I think Tom Cruise has been in so many more badass movies. Not that I don't love Will Smith in movies like Ali. I think that's a, an amazing mm. movie. But yeah, Tom Cruise has had some pretty great movies that have some great soundtracks, like you know the Mission Impossible movies, and he's he's diversified and gotten pretty edgy. So there's a lot to choose from there. Do you see that you are on the face of both of these gentlemen? <laughs> oh, I didn't even know that. Look at that. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's your you're, 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 I gotta like. Uh, <laughs> you, gotta you gotta send that to me. <laughs> okay, I will. I absolutely will. All right, here's the next one. Would you rather, ooh, be trapped in the Matrix or trapped in the Truman Show? Well, aren't we all trapped in the Matrix? Oh God, I took the wrong pill. Oy. Yeah, no, we are. We're living in a fantasy world that's you know meant to keep us subdued and asleep. Mm. So I don't know. It's like a trick question. The Truman Show. It, we wouldn't know it if we're trapped in it. That's the whole point, right? You don't know that you're on a TV show that's 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I guess it's hard yeah, It's hard to choose. But I guess, you know, The Matrix was more like a real world representation. And then like, I look at The Truman Show. The Truman Show was like an old school 60s like vibe uh, and like an old sitcom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know which one I'd rather. Yeah, Matrix. Yeah. You know, Matrix. you always wondered like, would you want to be put back to sleep? And just think it's real again, like mm. the one guy that betrayed all of them and Cipher, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they want to come back as someone important, famous, rich, whatever. It's like 
you wouldn't know. So what would oh. you do? It's like the movie Vanilla Sky. Same deal. Oh, I was so just good. talking about that movie the other day. What a great film. Tom Cruise, cool. right? Tom Cruise. There you go. Yeah. Boom. Right. That's right. There, that's a great Tom Cruise movie. A lot of people hate that movie, and I get it, but I liked it. So and I, obviously, you guys did too, but it's very similar to The Matrix and choices that you make, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. We have one final one, Elgin. All right. Here we go. Would you rather play the first rock concert on the moon or play the first rock concert under the sea? Oh, the moon would be amazing. How cool yeah. would it be? I mean, you know, if you can get past the whole, you know, space travel and having to train to be an astronaut. But yeah, sure. That'd be pretty amazing. Well, you awesome. said that you've traveled all different ways, but, you know, hopefully rocket ship. Yeah, not not like that just yet. <laughs> right? They'd we'll get you a great some, pillow. Mm -hmm. They do call it a rocket ship. So. Rocket ship. They'd have to figure out some technology that doesn't have the whole, like, zero gravity, like, sickness and all that. Yeah, I think we're a ways off. Fair, fair. Well, yeah, we shall see. But, Glenn, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us again. Yeah, great question. I like I like the games. That's actually pretty cool. They're fun, right? Yeah, we yeah. we have a good time like coming up with each game for every different guest that we have. So thank you for being so open yeah, and honest. Um, before you wrap this up, uh, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Uh, everybody, just cross your fingers that we get back to some kind of normalcy, whatever that's going to look like, the new normal. We all just miss everything so much. I miss just walking 200 yards across the street and going and sitting in that restaurant over there and just having breakfast or something. Simple things. We're like appreciating them so much more now. So just everyone do your part. Let's get like vaccinated and get back to just going out and hanging with friends and concerts. We all miss it. So just positive energy, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Positive everyone do your part so we can see Glenn Sobel on the road again soon. <laughs> yes. But, uh, okay, before we do wrap this up, uh, let's go over our upcoming guests that we have. So next Tuesday, we have Casey Jost from Impractical Jokers Insider. Next Thursday, we have Edward Furlong from oh, Terminal cool. Uh, we're also really excited to welcome back Corey Taylor from Slipknot and Stone Sour and a lot of really incredible guests throughout the month of February as well. Chris Hansen, we're bringing him back. We're very excited. But uh, Glenn, this has been such an oh, honor. Chris Hansen, the guy from To Catch a Predator. Oh my God. That's none yeah. other. <laughs> wow. It's so that's funny. Cool. That, that's always the guest. Everyone's like, you got Chris Hansen. <laughs> that was just a good episode too. I can't wait to have money back. It's going to be yeah. awesome. Pretty and cool guest you got coming. Edward Furlong. Wow. Yeah. We're going to have fun. Uh, I'm so excited for that one. Uh, I wanted to say, Glenn, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Derek Frank on the stream, and he just oh, cool. sung your praises. He absolutely adores you. Oh, yeah. Well, he is one of my favorite bass players to play with. And that guy's done some heavy gigs himself. You know, uh, Gwen Stefani currently, but also Shania Twain and Shakira. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What The way him and I uh, have played together the most is our residency gig in Los Angeles, which I miss so much. Oh, my God. Oh. That's. That's at Lucky Strike in Hollywood. And it, it used to be every week, which is nuts, that we used to learn this whole batch of new songs every week. We loved it, but it got to be a lot of work. Now it's monthly, more quality control. But, oh, yeah, the guests that we would play with, you know, uh, the last, a year ago was one of the last ones we did. We had Sully Erna and Gavin DeGraw with Nuno Betancourt. And wow. um, such, a, such an epic night. And I just look at videos of that. I'm like crying because I'm like, oh, I miss this so much. I want to get back to doing all this. But it's yeah, gonna happen. I do that gig and we have a blast. We don't make a ton of money because it's free to get in. We do it because we love it. That's awesome. Amen. It's gonna yeah. happen. We're gonna it's gonna open again and everything's gonna be we just have to stay diligent, cross our fingers, people. Come on, we want to see Glenn again. Yes. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, so I hope we see you guys out on the road. Yeah, that'd be killer. Heck Absolutely. yeah, man. Well, thank you so much, Glenn, and we will see you guys next week. Please be safe, everybody. We'll see you all real soon. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs>